Hello, Kristen Knudsen, Production Manager and Technical Director at the College Light Opera Company. Behind the Scenes with Kristen Knudsen is made possible by a generous gift from Clyde Tyndale and Deb Winograd. Last week we talked about lighting instruments and how they evolved over time. This week I want to talk about lighting control systems, so dimmers and lighting consoles, things that allow you to manipulate the light but are not lighting instruments themselves. I still had more material than could fit into this episode, so if you happen to be watching the Facebook premiere, be sure to check out the comments because I'll be lurking and I'm gonna post a few fun photos that didn't make it into this episode. Dimmers are devices connected to light fixtures for controlling light output. They allow gradual fades between darkness and full brightness and the modern artistry of theatrical lighting design couldn't exist without them. Theater artists have been trying to control stage lighting since at least the early 1500s when theater started to move indoors. Candle and torchlit stages were dim to begin with, but stagehands could snuff out the flames whenever greater darkness was desired. In the early 1600s, Italian architect and influential inventor of stage machinery, Nicola Sabatini, suggested a candle dimming system comprised of metal cylinders rigged to lower over candles to obscure some or all of the light. At the turn of the 19th century, when gaslighting became the norm, theaters that adopted gas systems gained considerably greater control over the intensity of stage illumination. Gas flame could be controlled by adjusting the flow of gas to the fixture, producing a larger and brighter or smaller and dimmer flame. Gas lighting systems required extensive plumbing and operators would manipulate valves to direct the gas to different groupings of lights, often without any direct view of the stage. Of course, electrical technology was being developed simultaneously with the rise of gas lighting. As I discussed last week, those early electric fixtures were mostly carbon arc lamps, which were either on or off. So apart from mechanical shutters to obscure the beam, there was no control of brightness. I previously misidentified this image as an example of gas lighting due to some mislabeling, but I have since realized it is actually an illustration of one of the earliest demonstrations of electric lighting control, presented at the 1882 Munich Electrotechnical Exhibition. You can see the lighting operator standing stage left at a bank of levers, perched above what looks like a power distribution box. And although it's not pictured, this setup reportedly included a saltwater dimmer as part of the power supply system. Before we look at examples of saltwater dimmers, let's learn a little bit about what makes electrical dimming possible in the first place. How about some basics of electricity, just to make sure we're all on the same page in regard to terminology? I pulled this information from several great sources as I was searching for the simplest explanations to share with you all, so I will include a list of websites at the conclusion of this video for those of you who are interested in diving even deeper into the science behind electricity. Electricity is created by the movement of electrons, which are subatomic particles that carry a negative charge. Since an electron has charge, it has a surrounding electric field. And if that electron is moving relative to an observer, said observer will observe it to generate a magnetic field. A circuit is simply a closed loop that allows charge to move from one place to another. For discussions about circuits and electrical charge, it's helpful to be clear on the terms we use to describe its movement. Voltage is the difference in charge between two points. It's the amount of potential energy between two points on a circuit. The unit volt is named after Italian physicist Alessandro Volta, who invented what is considered to be the first chemical battery. Current is the rate at which charge is flowing, or the amount of charge flowing through a circuit over a period of time. Current is measured in amps, named after French mathematician and physicist André-Marie Ampère. One amp represents six quintillion, 241 quadrillion electrons per second passing through a point in a circuit. Resistance is a material's tendency to resist the flow of charge. The higher the resistance within a circuit, the less current flowing through it. Resistance is measured in ohms, named after Bavarian scientist Georg Ohm. One ohm is defined as the resistance between two points in a conductor where the application of one volt will push one amp of current. Ohm's law states that voltage equals current in amps times resistance. Another way you might be able to visualize these three terms is with the analogy of a river. 
Imagine electrical charge as the water upstream, the potential energy that will come flooding through the system. Think of current or amperage as the volume or amount of water trying to pass through the river at a given moment. Then picture the varying width and depth of the river as resistance. A wide river obviously allows more water through at once, even if it moves slower. If you pick a point along the river and observe the water pressure or forcefulness created by the current and any resistance it has met, that is the equivalent of voltage, in this analogy at least. Returning to how this relates to dimmers, if voltage is a relationship between current and resistance, and you want to decrease or increase that voltage to change the brightness of a lighting instrument, you want to increase or decrease resistance in the system. You need a variable resistor. A rheostat, sometimes referred to as a potentiometer, even though they are slightly different things, is a variable resistor which is used to control the flow of electricity. They are able to vary the resistance in a circuit without interruption. Rheostats are typically constructed as wire-wound resistors with two separated wires wrapped around an insulating core and a mechanical wiper or sliding contact which moves over the windings. The first connection is made to one end of the resistive wire element and the second connection is attached to the wiper. The more wire wraps between the two connections, the greater the resistance, resulting in decreased current and therefore a dimmer light. Before mechanical rheostats found their way on stage inside early dimmer panels, there was the salt water dimmer, or liquid rheostat. Instead of wire wraps around a core, liquid rheostats use an electrolyte solution as a resistor. A liquid rheostat typically consists of a tank containing brine. The tank itself might be steel, serving as its own negative electrode, or it may be made of ceramic or glass with a metal plate placed at the bottom. A positive electrode in the form of a steel rod is suspended above the tank and rigged so the rod can be lowered into the liquid. Once the rod makes contact with the liquid, the circuit is completed and electricity begins to flow. As the rod is increasingly submerged in the tank, the distance the current must flow through the liquid gets shorter, decreasing resistance and resulting in higher voltage. Salt water dimmer systems did make their way into some theaters, but they're not very well documented. They took up a lot of space, since you needed a tank for each circuit you wished to control, generated a lot of heat, needed frequent topping off with water and regular maintenance to control inevitable corrosion, and they presented a significant shock hazard as many exposed parts were energized during operation. It's also worth noting that when in operation, saltwater dimmers are releasing hydrogen and chlorine gas through electrolysis. You can see that release in action where you see bubbles forming at the electrodes. Early dimmers were directly controlled through the manual manipulation of large dimmer panels. This required all power to come through the lighting control location, often taking up considerable space and putting operators at closer risk for electrical shock. Banks of mechanical rheostats were operated through the use of levers, sometimes with interlocking capabilities, but generally operated as single lighting circuits. It took real muscle to run some of these panels. There was no presetting of cues, everything had to happen live, so to speak. The hand of the operator determined how smoothly the lights would fade in and out. For complex cues involving many lights, several stagehands had to get involved to reach all the levers simultaneously. I'd like to share more of this excellent demonstration of a rotary rheostat dimmer. A resistance dimmer is really quite simple. You have a very large variable resistor, also known as a rheostat or a potentiometer, depending on how old you are, and it is hooked in series with your lights. That's it. You have power source, big resistor, lights, done. The power flow through this is also pretty simple. Um, we have plugs on the front so we can plug in our lights, and then the neutral from the plugs comes down here to a little screw terminal on this plate, which then goes around here to this variable resistor, and then goes across this wiper arm to the other variable resistor, where it goes around and then goes back out again. Moving this lever moves that wiper arm, which means that the electricity has to travel through more or less of the variable resistor. I have a board here with two 150 watt light bulbs mounted on it. One of them is currently unscrewed to the point where it doesn't make contact. 
if I plug the system in, it currently only has 150 watts of load on it. And that happens. Now, if I just simply reach over and screw this light bulb in till it makes contact, now I have sufficient load, I can actually take it all the way out. And then I can just go over here, lights go up, lights go down. If I am to unscrew one of these, the other one starts glowing again. For some time, it seemed that companies were competing in some kind of dimmer measuring contest, looking to one-up each other with the biggest dimmer panel possible. While impressive to behold, these behemoths must have been a nightmare to operate. Rheostats made way for variable auto-transformer dimmers, no less bulky than their rheostat cousins in the early years, but more efficient and typically boasting a more consistent dimming effect. Auto transformers differ from rheostats in that they only utilize one continuous winding instead of two, with opposite sides of the same wire coil serving as both primary and secondary winding. The term auto transformer refers to the single coil, not to any kind of automatic mechanism. They were still very much a manual, mechanical piece of equipment. Variable auto transformers are sometimes referred to by the trademark name Variac. This dimmer came out of a, an, a lighting board that the Oberon GNS players brought from Oberon. Gotcha. This one got removed because it had mechanical issues, which never got fixed because it required parts we couldn't get. So that was a board that I think originally had six but when I met it, only five were in it. Uh -huh. And we wound up much of the time with only four working. I looked this up, or I was looking in, in actually the mechanicalist book, and found a picture of this that said this was the first auto transformer a commercially made uh, dimmer for the theater. And that book is copyrighted in the very early 30s. So whether this unit is that old or it's a slightly newer one, I don't know. Uh, in the late 60s, I tried to get some parts for one and had to do some major upgrades because these were the older model that they didn't make parts for anymore. But this is one of the original ones. And uh, the arm here went to a, a big handle on a, on a shaft uh -huh. as it would push it and pull it with a lever arrangement. And there was a means so that you could lock, there was a handle on the end of the shaft so that you can lock the handles in so that you can run them together. Right. It took a lot of force. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, so you could run them individually or mechanically lock them together, which is pretty common for boards of that vintage. That's, that's the connections in and out. But the auto transformer dimmer was a big improvement over what were previously in the theater resistance dimmers, which had to have an extra load because the dimmer only worked properly if it had exactly the right load on it. Right. And if you didn't have that many lights, then you had a room that was sometimes called the ghost room uh, located someplace and that you just had a lot of light bulbs in it that you could patch into your lighting system to make up the wattage Mm -hmm. so that each dimmer had the full amount of wattage on it. Yeah. And then you had this room that just made light and heat. <laughs> <laughs> and the Falmouth Playhouse um, originally had that kind of rig. Gotcha. They had a resistance board and they had a room in, in the basement that had all the ghost lights in it. Awesome. So this dimmer it's a, a more modern, like maybe 1950s, okay. vintage uh, auto transformer dimmer. This is the kind, in fact, this was a spare for the lighting board that was in the theater when I first came here. Okay. The one that you have all the yeah. some old pictures of. Uh, and so this is, well, the, the old Ward Leonard is linear. This one is turned around in a circle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that the and it's rotates. got that spot that's making contact right there. Yeah, there's a carbon brush, just like in a motor. Yeah. 
that makes contact on the top of the coil as it goes around. And the wiring points are here. And it was rigged, some of this stuff is apart, but on the, sh on the end of the shaft was a gear very much like that. Mm -hmm. And although this is out of a slightly different style board, it was a similar thing where it was mounted so that as you move this lever, yeah. it would rotate the gear. Cool. And uh, rotate the dimmer. And with this rig, there's no mechanical way. You have a row of them, there's no mechanical way to interconnect. Mm -hmm. So what we had, we had a whole set of sticks. Yeah wooden boards, some designed for of various lengths. So the board had six dimmers across, so we'd have six wide sticks and shorter sticks. Mm -hmm. And then we had some sticks with some holes in them because there were three banks vertically above okay. so that you could grab three dimmers in the vertical direction gotcha. with a stick uh, so that you could get some things to work together. Yeah. With the Oberlin board and the main boards here, it usually took at least two people to run a show. Yeah. Uh, and they were doing some very interesting ballet moves because it was not uncommon to have one hand on one dimmer, one hand on another, use your <laughs> knee for another one. Yeah. Uh, sometimes with the, it was arranged with the Oberlin board so you could be at one desk and actually be doing or use your foot to push one on. <laughs> <laughs> it was... It was so how many, I mean, how many circuits were you able to control with this old board? Do you remember? Uh, we had 18 plus four or five. Um, so what's that make? Uh, 23. Um, we had the means. There was another desk of three dimmers that could either be used as master dimmers mm -hmm. or as three additional depending on, and you could switch it depending on what you wanted to do. And we had means, I, I actually added the means into it so that some of the dimmers could be switched between different loads. So if you had a light that you used in one act, but not in another, gotcha. you could switch it and double purpose the dimmer. Great, yeah. But by today's standards, that wasn't very many dimmers. Right, yeah, that's pretty minimal. Uh, but by today's standards, there weren't very many lights over the stage either. Right. Great. So that's the old electromechanical dimmers. And then we can get into the more modern ones. Awesome. Dimmer control started to resemble modern day control systems starting in the 50s. The first electronic solid state dimmer was invented for household use by Joel Spira in 1959. These solid state dimmers operated on silicon controlled rectifiers, which conduct current in one direction, or triax, bi directional triode thyristors which allow current flow in both directions. With dimming made possible in a much smaller form factor with no moving parts, theatrical dimmer panels started to shrink. Long before true computerized control became possible, simple remote control boards emerged, allowing operators to step away from the dimmer rack itself and manipulate a much more manageable desk-sized panel of switches and sliders. These early control boards of the 1950s worked on the principle of setting up presets in which groups of sliders are preset in advance of a queue while the current queue is still active. These two scene preset boards were very popular through the 60s. Computer control boards emerged in the late 70s and early 80s. Queue presets could now be recorded and saved with data stored on cassette tapes and eventually three and a half inch floppy disks. The first official ETC branded console was the ELC or Entertainment Lighting Control System which was purpose-built for Disney's Epcot Center to run the Main Street Electrical Parade in 1977. A total of six consoles were made, and this board remained in use at Epcot until 1993. These early computer consoles included integrated or peripheral monitors for interfacing with the computer system. Computer lighting consoles communicate with the dimmer racks remotely with a data cable connection. Since the late 1980s, DMX512 has been the digital protocol of choice, at first cabled to a demultiplexer near the dimmers that converted the signal into analog control. DMX512 stands for Digital Multiplex with 512 Pieces of Information. 
Modern dimmers include microprocessors that convert the DMX signal directly and can provide diagnostic feedback to the control board. So this is a more modern dimmer pack. This dates from the late 1990s. Uh, this is one of four of this kind of pack that's in use in the theater now. Uh -huh. It's current equipment. It's all electronic. And the advantage of that is the actual lighting control board connects to this with a small digital cable. So it's easy to put the control board wherever you want it. Uh, the theater guild puts it in a booth at the back of the house. During tech rehearsals, we both put it at a tech table in the middle of the house, traditionally when you're teching a show. Uh -huh. And clock puts it backstage when we run the show. It's got 12 dimmers in it. Uh, series of modules. Each of these dimmer modules is two dimmers. Uh -huh. And the module at the bottom is the electronic control. It takes the digital signal from the board and it's got a microcomputer in it yeah. and does all the processing so it runs the dimmers. And so, and the dimmers are mostly all mounted backstage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Unlike the old boards where the thing that you were moving actually controlled the power. Right. Now the control of the power is, the control of the dimmer pack is remote and the dimmer pack handling all the power. Mm -hmm. So the heavy power wiring stays all backstage. Yeah. Uh, or digitally controlled dimmer pack. That's the power into it. And this is a short cable that links packs, but this is the control cable, mm -hmm. which basically looks sort of like a microphone cable, but isn't quite. Um, and this one I will open up because we've got to open it up to clean it anyway. Yeah. And this particular model is still in current production. Okay. I can't fire it up easily here, but you've got a nice digital readout you mm -hmm. can do. It's got a lot of onboard functions. Might be a little dusty inside, but it's not too bad. That's not bad. Yeah. So what you've got here is these are the connectors for the outputs uh -huh. that go to the lights. A row of circuit breakers on the front. Uh, this is a fan, gotcha. a long yep. rotary fan. Uh, on the board that has all the smart electronics that are hard to see because they're under the fan. Uh -huh. Has a microprocessor in it. Um, and these units under the heat sinks. Each of those is a quad um, electronic re uh, relay, okay. essentially, which is a switch, which does the smart switching and controlling the dimmers. And these are coils that help reduce electrical interference noise. Gotcha. Um, and so these guys are what actually handle the power. Okay. The smart stuff tells them what to do. Okay. And each one is worth four. So there's 12 dimmers in this pack. Okay. And it's not very big and it's not very heavy. And these are obviously designed to be mounted in an actual rack. Yeah, they go in a rack. And uh, we've got two of them in a rack. We put them up in the loft so they're closer to the lights that are up there. So we don't have to run a lot of cables up there. This is what's called a, often called a truss pack. So you can, as a little auxiliary source, this is six dimmers control with the digital inputs. It has a little readout uh, and power so that you can put it close to the lights mm -hmm. uh, to reduce your wiring. Just hang it right on the pipe. Hang it right on the pipe, run six lights from it. We're fortunate to have a relatively new lighting console at the Highfield Theater. We've had our ETC Ion XE for a couple years. It's a compact model first released in 2017, still in production, and a very popular choice for smaller theaters and school programs. It runs the most current ETC software, so technicians learning board ops on this model should have no trouble translating their knowledge to larger consoles in the future. Uh, but I mean, it, are they actually touch screens? They are actually oh, wow. touch screens. And if I plugged them in correctly, one of them will work that way. Gotcha. Um, Yep, this one does. Basically, this thing could 
uh, easily handle uh, how many universes have we got out of this thing? We got four. We could handle 2,000 lights on this guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I forget how many possible cues, some humongous stack yeah. of possible cues. Basically, for a theater our size, it has no limits. Right. Uh, it's modern. It will run moving lights very handily. Mm -hmm. Our old board, you could sort of run them, but it really tax the board and the operator. Yeah. Um, and so this, this board's only two or three years old. Great. Uh, it is very current production. Um, and uh, so we're now set up on the tech table the way we would be during a tech rehearsal. Okay. And often when you're running a show, you take it down to one screen. Mm -hmm. um, two, the multiple screens are really handy when you're programming. It's actually possible to, on one of the screens, put up a magic sheet of your show. Gotcha. Uh, so that you see which lights you're messing with. And it's very smart, so it'll do all the modern board tricks. Uh, offline storage is a USB stick. <laughs> Better and, than the old floppy. And I didn't plug them in, but we even it's its basically a specialized computer. Yeah, it takes a we mouse. We got a keyboard, keyboard we got everything. a mouse, we got, yeah. yeah. Very programmable. I know that you can the all of these faders you can program to do lots of different things. Yeah. Um, with a little screen that tells you what you're doing. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So the the uh, coding and the signals that are set over the DMX line will control up to 512 dimmers. Right. Okay. Yeah. And if you need more, then you set up what's called the second universe which is the next 512 dimmers. Yeah. Odd infinitum. Mm -hmm. And big shows have many universes. This, this one will take four right off the bat. Great. Uh, which is where I get 2,000 lights. Right. Uh, it, it's the equivalent of 2,000 dimmers. Now you don't quite get 2,000 lights if you use modern movers because they have so many functions that they could use 30 or more channels just to yeah. control one light. Right. Which is why you need so many. I'm stepping through cues that are loaded into it. You can see the cue number there. Uh, this probably got in at the last show the Theater Guild did. Gotcha. And you can see here with the timer uh -huh. that so you can program the, the time of the, of the fade, the duration of the fade. Yep. Some are going faster than others. And as you can see, cue numbering, uh, it's been this way with electronic boards for a while, is not always in integers. That's very handy because if you, you start off more. with integers, then it gives you the ability to add cues in between without yeah. messing the sequence. Yeah. Now that we've reached the era of computer control as standard, let's talk about the difference between hard and soft patching. The assigned connections between circuits and the dimmers is known as the hard patch the actual physical cabling that determines the electrical pathways. In older systems, to provide greater flexibility and allow changes between or during shows, circuits would connect to the dimmers by way of a patch bay. I'm sure you can picture an old telephone switchboard. All those short cables completed circuits that linked one phone number to another as needed. Theatrical patch bays work the same way. If it helps to visualize it, imagine the dimmers calling on different circuits to reach different lights. The lighting instruments are cabled to numbered circuits, which are then patched to numbered dimmers with a short cable at the patch bay. One dimmer might even have multiple circuits connected to it as a grouping. Soft patch refers to a digital version of this dimmer assignment. Everything gets cabled with one dimmer per circuit, and then the dimmers get patched into control channels using a computerized console. Here's a portion of a soft patching demonstration on ETC software. In EOS, we use channel numbers to tell the console which lights we want to manipulate. Patch is where we assign channel numbers to our dimmers and multi-parameter devices, like color-changing LEDs, moving lights, and other DMX-controlled fixtures. In a new show file, patch is one of the first things you'll need to do in order to communicate with your rig. There are two ways to view patch. The default way is by channel, so I have channels on the first column in numerical order, followed by addresses. To switch to the other view, I can press my format button 
and that's going to put things in numerical order by address. For now, we're going to go back to channel view. So let's patch a couple. So if I say 601 at, because we are in the channel view here, the console is going to assume channel, and it puts that word on the command line for us. And then when I press at, it puts the word address for me. We're going to say 250, enter. So what I've done here is I've patched address 250, which could be a dimmer, into channel 601. I can also patch a range of channels. So for example, 604 through 610 at address 101 is going to assume that each of those channels has one address in it and will populate those consecutively throughout the range of channels. Some modern equipment requires more than a simple dimmer to channel patch. Color LED instruments and moving lights require a constant power supply, usually cabled with Edison extension cords and bypassing the dimmers, and all of the light's parameters are controlled by individual DMX channels. A color-changing LED fixture needs an absolute minimum of three channels so it can control the intensity of its red, green, and blue diodes. Moving lights need many more channels. Just as an example, a Verilite 3000 spot uses 28 individual channels to control intensity, panning movement, tilting movement, focus, zoom, LED color mixing, including a color wheel, multiple gobo rotators, strobe, and more. Moving lights are very popular for concert events and large venue productions. They are incredibly versatile, and while they might be heavy and a bit of a pain to hang, they are entirely focused from the ground at the console. Color LED fixtures in general are very beneficial for things like rep plots, where you need to set it and forget it, but still have the ability to change the color of your general illumination without climbing a ladder or going up in a grid to change out a gel. Our lighting inventory at the high field may not be very high-tech right now, but in the future, as funding allows, we will invest in white LED conversion kits for our Source 4 ellipsoidals and start collecting color LED PARs. It's very doubtful you'll ever see a moving light at the high field, since our grid and house ceiling is so low. Movers are quite large, need a fair amount of clearance to swing and pivot, and their onboard mechanical elements often include fans and shutters that generate a surprising amount of noise. This concludes our exploration of theatrical lighting. Apart from the usual suspects of Wikipedia and Encyclopedia Britannica, the links below were the ones I found most interesting and useful while I was preparing to film these episodes. I strongly encourage you to check them out. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed this two-part special on electrics. Behind the Scenes with Kristen Knutson is part of our larger series, Digital Clock. Digital Clock is made possible by a generous gift from Phil and Liz Gross. If you'd like to learn more about our programming or how you can become a supporter, please visit us at collegelightoperacompany.com. Join me next week. I'm going to talk about scenic painting. So if you want to get your hands dirty with some paint, I'm going to do a little faux finishing demonstration for you. Mm -hmm.